Thanks, Mom. Good morning, everybody. I want you to stand up and join us on this first song. Real simple. It goes kind of like this. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me. When I am surrounded, your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Turn around and greet a couple of people. Wish them a happy Mother's Day. Or not.
Good morning, everybody. Glad you're here on Mother's Day. Want to wish all the moms very happy Mother's Day. We have three moms on the stage, actually. We have Angela over here, Michaela, Kim are all all moms. Yep. Just today. Well, some of you know this is my first day without my mom. She passed away in September, and I know others of you have experience that or maybe the loss of a grandmother or someone that you're close to and so you know this day can be kind of bittersweet in some ways but on the other hand Jana the mother of my three children three children I know of <laughs> that's a joke that's a joke my three children <laughs> is here and my mother-in-law is here from uh, southeast Oklahoma on the front row so glad she's here I'm glad all of you guys here are here who are moms and want to wish you a happy Mother's Day. Now, my talk today is entitled, Here Comes the Judge, what? which just coincidentally is on Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. complete accident. Yep. But, you know, often <laughs> these days you hear people say, uh, uh, you know, judge not. Remember, judge not, right? You hear that uh, all the time or sometimes. And um, today we're going we're gonna to look at what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount and uh, about that, what it means doesn't mean and so forth and how it affects our lives but right now we're going to do one last song uh that's called as for me and my house it we will serve the lord it comes from joshua when he said that about his family and you know on mother's day i think this is uh, appropriate even though a man wrote that verse uh it's it's moms and grandmothers who often have the biggest spiritual influences in, in a lot of a lot of people's lives these days but anyway, whatever, regardless of your family situation, uh, if your family is not really united in faith, and you can think about this as, as your church family, all right? Chinese song first to Ni.
good morning, everyone. It's great to see you here today, and happy Mother's Day. Um, this is the day for mothers, so we get to do whatever we want, whenever we want. Do you know what I want for Mother's Day? A nap. That's what I want, and a time away from my kids. That's what I want for Mother's Day. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, we want to honor all the moms so if you are a mom, stand up and let's see who you are. We want to say thank you for all you do. Thank you, moms. We've got lots of moms around here. If you're a grandma, remain standing. Let's see all the grandmas around here. All right. You know, um, this is our first Mother's Day without Grammyo because she... Uh, great Grammy? Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll take a great one. This is our first Mother's Day without Grammy O, and she was always so funny because anytime we did the Mother's Day awards, like who has the most kids, who has the most grandkids, she would always say, I'm not going to do it because I'm tired of winning. She said it's some time for someone else to win, so um, I guess it's time for someone else to win. But we're glad that you're here today. The kids have prepared a special song and they are going to sing it to you, all about mothers. And it's our little kids, so let's give them a big round of applause. Come on, guys. job you guys what do you think the name of that song was I'm going with mommy was her name oh good job all right and um, we have a special Mother's Day video that the kids have put together talking about their moms so take a look at this and then we'll pray and collect our offering My, 
my mom's job is um, a dental hygienist. What does what does that mean? It means that she cleans people's teeth. Did she clean your teeth? Sometimes, yes. Are your teeth clean now? Yes. Let's look. One thing I love about my mom is that she makes good pancakes. Mama loves me. Your mama loves you? Yeah. Mama I love you, Mama. For fun, my mom likes to eat chocolate and work out on her elliptical. Mm -hmm. oh, happy Mother's mm -hmm. Day. We love you, Mom. Mm -hmm. What's one thing you really love about your mom? That she's really nice. My mom is a really good driver because she's always careful. One thing that makes my mom really mad is whenever I ask the same question over and over again. One thing I really love about my mom is her personality. What makes your mom mad? Me being really crazy. So Avery, why is your mommy's tummy so big? Mm. Did she just eat too much? No. Too much chocolate? <laughs> no. What's inside her tummy? A baby. A baby boy, right? No. Girl. A girl. What's her name going to be? Lyric. Lyric. What makes my grandma mad is when I yell loud, really loud, like super loud. Um, my mom is a better cook than chopper because she makes the best dishes and des desserts. Oh, I just can't take it. And my mom, that she's so sweet. What do you do that makes your mom mad? Break one of her favorite things. Is your mom a good driver? Yes. Why? Because she's so sweet. I love, um, something that I love about my mom is, um, when I accidentally spill something, she always cleans it up. I mean, she's never mad at me if I accidentally do something wrong. Probably, um, um, the Bible says that we should honor our mothers because they um, help us with a lot of stuff, like our homework and stuff. My mom, um, when she gets on my nerves, she's usually like telling the dog to stop barking and I'm trying to watch a video. I think the Bible says we should honor our mothers because they take care of us and they just help us through life. My mom's favorite movie is Emperor New, Emperor's New Groove. And she loves it because it's really funny. One thing I really love about my mom is that she's really kind. Daniel, what does your mom like to do for fun? Watch me suffer. What do you mean? Making me do Tori's yard work and her sitting back and watching. Nathan, what do you love most about your mommy? Um, I like her to hug me. She hugs you? Mm -hmm. Is she a good hugger? Mm -hmm. Aww. I love it when my mom lets me do things like going over to Matthew's because Jana lets me do whatever I want. Okay, not really. I love my mom because of her calmness and her kindness most of the time. I have a great mom. I love you, mom. What does your mom do for fun? We go to the park and um, we get to go, go sliding and she's scared to go on, to, on the slide. She's scared to go on the slide? Yes. Breland, where would your mom like to go on vacation? Um, Hawaii. Hawaii? Why would she want to go to Hawaii? Because she likes it there and it's she likes to go swimming. She likes to go swimming.
CJ, is your mom a better cook, cleaner, or shopper? Cook. Why? Because she, her food is amazing. What is your favorite thing she makes? Mashed potatoes. My mom's a good driver because she doesn't get any wrecks. What makes my mom mad is whenever I punch or hit Noah or Eli. Something funny my mom has done is walked around the house before school started with no pants on. Cabo, duh. My mom works at OU as a teacher. She makes a lot of money and she's really good at her job. The thing I love most about my mom is that she lets me hang out with Daniel so we can do whatever we want. Okay, not really. What I love most about my mom is that she cares about me and she likes to hang out with me a lot. I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. is probably like shrimp alfredo. It's really good. And I love and what I love most about my mom is that she really never gets mad at me about hardly anything. And what my mom does for fun is um watch in CIS or um sometimes read. Matthew, what do you love most about your grandma? How she loves me and cares for me and really likes to spend time with me. I love you, Nana. Matthew, if you could have any mom in the whole world besides the one that you have, who would you want it to be? Donna. I don't have to think about that one. I would want Donna to be my mom. What makes my mom happy is that when she, when I help her around the house with chores. What I love most about my mom is that she's always happy and she loves me very much. My, my favorite thing that my mom cooks is biscotti. My mom likes to go on vacation at the beach. What my mom does for fun is take us to the park. Happy Mother's Day! Only I can be the one to make a change. I don't know, you guys. If you want shrimp Alfredo, go to Karen's house. But if you want chicken nuggets, go to Sarah's over here. <laughs> Good, and yeah, and Pischetti. That's right. I know where I'm going for that, Bennett. All right. Well, happy Mother's Day, everyone. Thanks for um, everyone who helped with the breakfast this morning. I mean, Terry, Phyllis, Lily, Donna, all the dads, we really appreciate it. All right. Well, we're going to pray for the offering, and then the kids have something to give to all the moms. And if you're not a mom, um, I told them to give them to every female they see. So just take it and say thank you. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a day like today. To
Well, judge not is perhaps one of the most quoted verses in all the Bible. Now, interestingly, most people who quote this verse probably couldn't tell you where it's found in the Bible or who wrote or said it. And sometimes I think it's because they believe that gives them license to do, you know, whatever they want. And if someone frowns on or questions them about it, they can say, well, the Bible says judge not. So get off my case, right? Amazingly, it's not usually Christ followers who are quick to point, pull out this verse. It's often people who don't, don't even go to church and sometimes are even anti-Christian. But when it kind of serves their purposes, they suddenly become avid Bible quoters. You know, hey, who are you to you know, tell me what I should and shouldn't do? The Bible says, judge not. Now, on the other hand, churchgoers have developed a pretty bad reputation for being overly judgmental you know, too quick and too eager to criticize other people who they maybe don't feel measure up to their exacting standards of and unrealistic expectations. Well, today as we continue our series, Life in the Kingdom of God, after spending January, February, March, and April in Matthew chapters 5 and 6, we finally get to the third and final part, Matthew chapter 7. And here's the setting. Or situation, you know, Jesus was born in Nazareth, he grew up in, or born in Bethlehem, he grew up in Nazareth, and now at the age of 30, he's just beginning his public ministry. But he started off pretty low key. He traveled from one village to another, he spoke in their synagogues and to smaller groups of people here and there. He had even performed a few miracles. But then came the big day that Jesus would take his ministry public in a large, on a large scale. Now, people throughout Israel had already heard about this new so-called prophet, this uh, supposed healer and miracle worker. And so when word began to spread that Jesus would be appearing live and in person at the Sea of Galilee Amphitheater, he was going to explain what was behind this new kingdom that he kept talking about establishing. And everyone said, I want to be there. You know, I want to hear this guy. I want to see this guy for myself. And Jesus does this, this talk. It's called the Sermon on the Mount uh, now. But his talk addresses all kinds of really relevant issues. He starts off with how to find happiness. Everybody's interested in that. Then he talks about some of the potential costs of following him. He talks about the disadvantages of having a heart filled with hate instead of a heart filled with love. He talks about how to get along with people. He speaks on things like marriage and divorce, honesty and integrity answering mistreatment with kindness. He talks about giving and praying in secret, storing up your treasures in heaven, overcoming worry, you know, all issues we still deal with today, 2,000 years later. Which brings us to our, our scripture passage where Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, as I mentioned, you know, this first part of the verse, uh, this passage has been quoted and misquoted and misapplied many, many times over the past 2,000 years since it was said, and probably never more than in present-day United States of America. People today use judge not that ye be not judged to convey the idea of, hey, you live your lifestyle and I'll live mine. You know, but don't try to tell me how to live and certainly don't try to impose your standards of morality on me. And then if anyone ever questions really anyone about virtually anything anymore, they're considered intolerant. You know, you say anything. Oh, they're a woman hater. He's anti-Muslim. He's, anti he's a homophobe. He's a racist. 
This has become so common now that everybody today walks around on eggshells afraid that they might accidentally do or say something that will offend someone or be perceived as judgmental. And this is kind of has given birth to what we call the politically correct movement. And I think maybe it started when uh, stores changed their advertisements and signs from Merry Christmas to Happy Holidays. You know, they didn't want to offend anyone or exclude Jewish people or atheists or agnostics or Buddhists or Hindus or whatever and who might not be Christians and who might not celebrate Christmas. And then you remember when policemen became police officers, firemen became firefighters, chairman is now chairperson, and you know, those are, those are good because women now do those jobs, so that makes sense. Others of the politically correct terms I, I'm not so sure of. You know, like an illegal alien is now referred to as an undocumented worker. A homeless person is now an outdoor urban dweller. You can't even say someone's dead anymore. Instead, they're just living impaired. You can't refer to anyone as a mobster. Now the politically correct term is publicly elected official. No one is a failure. That's a terribly negative term. They're not a failure. They're just experiencing deferred success. <laughs> the term pet owner, seriously, has come into some question because, you know, that would offend dogs and animals. They don't want to feel like someone owns them. So it's now a pet guardian or a pet companion. You can't even use the word wife anymore. Now it's unpaid sex worker. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was bad. One time we were getting ready to go out to eat on family night, and one of my kids says, hey, how about El Chico's? And I said, ah, I don't feel like Mexican tonight. And one of my kids says, daddy, why are you a racist? It's like, ah, I'm not a racist because I don't eat Mexican food tonight. Well, this problem of people unfairly judging others was very common even back in Jesus' day, and it was especially true among the religious leaders at that time. They were very quick to look down upon and to pass judgment on those who they feel didn't live up to their expectations. In fact, they regularly used a certain term to identify a category of people who they most despised, who they thought had the, had the least value of anybody, and that term was sinners. They called them sinners, and, uh, and you know, as if they themselves were completely pure and, and sinless. And so on the hillside that day, as Jesus was speaking, there were thousands of people there. Again, it's kind of like Woodstock, you know, Jesus is in all this huge mass of people. And about two-thirds of the way through his talk, he brings us this hot-button issue of judging. So when Jesus says, judge not, what do you think he meant? Does he mean never to discern anything about anyone else's words or actions? Never make any assessments of anyone else's conduct? You know, judge not. Never try to determine if you're being conned or deceived by somebody. You know, if the customer says the check is in the mail for the fourth time, you smile and go, great, thank you. Judge not when a television preacher promises health, wealth, and happiness if you just send him a big check. Don't judge, just, you know, bring out, get out the checkbook. When a politician promises you if you'll vote him into office, he'll lower your taxes. Don't judge. Is that what Jesus means by judge not? Does he mean that we should just suspend all critical analysis and downplay our discernment abilities, you know, disregard those intuitive signals that can smell a con coming? Well, that can't be what he's prohibiting because Jesus himself said otherwise uh, other places in the Bible. Like in Matthew 10, verse 16, he says, I want my followers to be wise as serpents, but yet gentle as doves. In other words, he's saying, I want them to have some street smarts. Don't be gullible and naive about everything. You've got to have some savvy. In 1 John 4, 1, the Bible warns to test the spirits. Always have your antenna up because there are a lot of deceivers and charlatans out there. In Matthew 7, which we're going to get to in a few weeks, Jesus says, watch out for what Bible teachers and preachers you buy into. He said, look into their lives to make sure that, you know, how they live when the spotlights aren't on is consistent with what they're saying. Sounds to me like Jesus expects us to be highly discerning people. Then what does he mean when he says, judge not? Well, in these five short verses, Jesus gives, Jesus gives three biblical principles about this very thing. And uh, the first one goes like this. Judge others in the exact manner that you yourself wish to be judged. 
And I'll explain this first step by asking you a question. How do you feel when someone makes a hasty appraisal of you or something you've done and it happens to be an inaccurate appraisal and they pass it on to other people? How does that make you feel? Bet you don't like it. Well, I want to tell you a story. I, I know I've mentioned this before, but you know, one of the perks of living here is you never know when you might run into some hives and trophy winners, right? A few months ago, Jan and I were eating at a restaurant outside, and we ran into Steve Owens and Billy Sims, and I'm the one in the middle. <laughs> Can you tell? But a number of years ago, most of us were shocked and deeply saddened when we heard about Steve Owens' son, Blake, who had taken his own life. It was a terrible, uh, tragic thing. Well, that took place on a Saturday. Well, the following Monday, I went out to the Y to play basketball, as I always did, and one guy said, was talking about it, and he said, isn't that horrible? He said, I guess the kid couldn't live up to his famous dad's expectations. And so what, I mean, is, what kind of thing is that to say about a father who's just lost his son to suicide? I mean, what's he saying, that Steve Owens is responsible for the death of his son? And I don't always do this, but in that situation, I spoke up and I said, you know, I, I don't have all the facts, but, you know, I grew up in Miami, Oklahoma, where Steve is from, and one of my older sisters was best friends with Barbara, Steve's wife, and I said, did you know that, you know, Blake has had years and years of emotional struggles and bouts with chronic depression, and I said something to the effect of, you know, we should probably not pass judgment on situations that we don't know every, enough about. Now, the man who said that, he has since moved away. I'm still friends with him on Facebook, and he's not a bad guy. It's just that's, that's very typical of many of us to run off at the mouth, expressing our opinions about people with, when our understanding of their situation is really, really limited. And that's one of the reasons Jesus says, judge not. Because the truth is, we are incapable of correctly judging other people when all we see, usually, is the tip of the iceberg. The second biblical principle is found in Matthew 7, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank, the two-by-four, sticking out of your own eye? I'll put it this way. Judge others with the full awareness that we tend to judge others far more harshly than we judge ourselves. Right? How easy it is to fault find and point the accusing finger at others while we tend to rationalize and minimize our own mistakes and weaknesses. You remember in John chapter 8 when the religious leaders brought to Jesus a woman who had been caught committing adultery. The man wasn't brought, just the woman. And they were there ready to pass judgment on her and to practice what in that day was capital punishment, stone her to death right then and there. But you remember when Jesus brought it, the proper perspective on things when he said, okay, whichever one of you has never committed a sin in your life, you cast the first stone. If you've never done anything wrong, then you have the right to cast the first stone. You know, for all of us here today, whether you've had perfect attendance in church since you were an infant, or if you just got out of the penitentiary last week, no matter how good a life you've lived or how sinful a life you've lived, there's not a person in this place that is without sin, right? But our tendency is to take out the, the, the microscope and the tweezers and go after that speck of sawdust in somebody else's eye, and somehow we don't realize that we're not really in a great position to be passing judgment. Now, the classic example of this from the Bible comes from the Old Testament, uh, who Phil talked about a couple of weeks ago, King David. At the height of his reign, he has a palace full of wives and a palace full of mistresses and a palace full of concubines, a lot of women. But one day he's out on the palace balcony and he sees a beautiful woman taking a bath on a roof nearby. Her name was Bathsheba and he sent someone to bring her to the palace. They have an affair. David has her husband killed and then he marries her. And he doesn't lose a wink of sleep over the whole deal. Well, shortly thereafter, God sent a prophet named Nathan to talk to David. And he came before the, David and he said, Oh, wise king, there is a legal matter that I'm handling and I, I really need your infinite wisdom. I've got a really tough judgment to make and can you help me? David says, Sure, no problem. 
Well, Nathan said, here's the case. It seems as if there is a very wealthy man whose next door neighbor is very, very poor. Well, the rich guy had an unexpected guest drop by for dinner one night, and wanting to impress his guest, he decided to serve him a rack of lamb. But rather than kill a lamb from his own vast herds, he goes next door to the poor man's little shack, and this guy only has one lamb. And this lamb was like a family pet. He, you know, set it by the dinner table, slept in the bed with the kids, all that. Nathan tells David, well, the wealthy man, he barges right in, he grabs that little lamb out of the poor man's arms, has it slaughtered, and feeds it to his guest. He says, now, King David, what sentence should be given for what that wealthy man did? Well, David can barely contain himself. He's like, kill him, and then hurt him real bad. <laughs> it reminds me of that biker scene from the Pee Wee Herman movie. Well, we, we actually have a clip of it for you right now, in, ca in, case, you, in case you can't remember. <laughs> we let him go <laughs> well anyway David you know he just, I, this is, he just goes ballistic I mean he is foot stomping mad he said what is our kingdom coming to how could this rich guy barge in and steal from that guy his only one you know how could anyone do anything so cruel and even to, evil which, to which Nathan remember he said David you're that man you're the man you know that phrase you the man that's the, where it originated right here <laughs> you the man Anyway, Nathan says, David, you did the very same thing to steal that man's wife with Bathsheba. And at that very moment, David started having a really bad day. He had to look in the mirror and see himself for who he really was, a low-down, sinful human being with that dark propensity to be able to easily see the, the evil and cruelty and injustice in other people's situations, but be blinded to his own. So next time we're ready to, you know, rip somebody, label somebody, condemn somebody, just push the pause button for a moment and remember Matthew 7, 1. Judge others with the full awareness that you and I tend to judge them a lot more harshly than we judge ourselves. So biblical principle one, judge others in the... Whoop, what happened, Kim? Hello? That's weird. Hello? Okay. Was it just me? I'm hearing things. Anyway, judge others in the exact manner that you yourself wish to be judged. And number two, judge others with the full awareness that we tend to be a lot harsher on other people than we are on ourselves. And now number three, judge others only after sober self-evaluation and even then proceed very cautiously. This comes from Matthew 7, 5. First, take the plank out of your eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You know, next time you catch yourself passing judgment on someone else, ask yourself if maybe part of the reason would be that when you do that and you put someone else down, it does kind of make you feel a little better, a little better, a little bigger, a little smarter, a little more spiritual than them. And that's usually part of the equation. So next time you, ask, you begin to pass judgment, ask yourself, is this more about me or is this more about them? Do I really know the whole situation? Or do I just maybe see the tip of the iceberg? Do I have all the facts? Am I absolutely sure I have all the correct facts? Recently, I read a story, of, uh, a, a true story of something that happened to a pastor guy. And here it is in his own words. He says, one time at, after I made my weekly hospital visits and was headed to my car in the parking lot, I saw a young nurse whom I had counseled before concerning her marital problems. I asked her how she was doing, and she began describing her latest difficulties. It was winter, and a, br and a bitterly cold wind was blowing. So I invited her to sit in my car because of the cold and because it was obvious this might take a little while. 
Then he writes, as we sat in the car, she came to the end of what she wanted to say, and then to my utter bewilderment, she laid her head on my shoulder. At that very moment, a couple from my church walked by the front of my car. They were on their way to the hospital to visit a family member that I had just seen. And he writes, it was one of the most awkward moments of my life. I have always been grateful that those folks never mentioned the situation, and I never heard anything about any rumors going around the church. You know, we don't always have all the facts, do we? Now, because there is so much misinformation and confusion these days about judging people and being intolerant and political correctness and so forth, I, wa I want to show you a verse in Romans 14.1 that addresses what you might call gray issues. It says, Except the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. In other words, while some things are clearly addressed in the Bible, other issues are not. For instance, the scriptures tell us repeatedly that Jesus is God's Son, the Messiah, God in the flesh, the only Savior who can get you into heaven. And if you say that, you know, at work or at school, you're not being intolerant. You're not slamming other people who disagree with you or don't believe that. You have a right to express your convictions in a respectful, non-judgmental manner. The Bible also clearly teaches that marriage is to be between a man and a woman. And it's not being intolerant to say you believe that. However, if we rant and rave and judge and condemn, we will likely do more harm than good. You know, Jana and I have some friends, some neighbors. Uh, I've known them for decades, actually. Two women who are married to each other. We see them frequently. I like them. I care about them. I, I talk to them. They know what I do. But I try to be toward them the same way that I think Jesus would be. But I still believe what the Bible says about marriage. Now, Romans 14.1 refers to disputable matters. And some people would argue that saying Jesus is the only way to heaven is a disputable matter. Or that marriage is to only be between a man and woman is a disputable matter. Well, from a social standpoint, point they are. But from a biblical standpoint, they really aren't. And that's because there, are, there is an overwhelming number of incidences where those issues are addressed clearly in the Bible. And there are many others that fall into that category. However, there are many what could be called disputable matters that weren't addressed in the Bible. Like, is casual, occasional gambling okay? You know, for, for Christians, let's say. I remember back when people started, more and more people got tattoos. People were like, well, is it wrong to get a tattoo? You know, one of my best friends from high school uh, went through a divorce a few years ago, and he married someone 25 years younger than him. Okay? Some people like frown upon that, and I don't have a big opinion, but I mean, is it wrong to marry somebody 25 years younger or older than you? I don't know of any verses that speak to that. Disputable matters are things like who you vote for. Or, you know, drinking a beer now and then, or having wine with dinner, or champagne at a wedding. Some Christians will go crazy on those kinds of issues, and other people feel like it's okay. You know, uh, a married couple choosing not to have children. Young people choosing to have spiky hairdo, or mohawk, you know, or purple hair, or whatever. You may not want to do that, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's unbiblical, right? Those are gray areas. Those are issues that are not clearly addressed and answered in the Bible. But I think it's getting harder and harder to know, as a Christian, what the God-honoring thing is to do in more and more contemporary issues. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, Target released a statement that customers and employees can use the restrooms and changing rooms that correspond to their gender identity. You may have seen the new uh, thing on YouTube with the Titanic, and it's the guy's loading up people in the life rats. They said, men and women, or women and children only. And one guy says, well, I, I identify as a, as a female. <laughs> can, I get, can I get in the room? <laughs> when Target did this, a lot of people are going, oh, that's wonderful. That is fabulous. And other people are going, that's horrible. That's a terrible thing. Now, while once American life was heavily influenced by the church, God, the Bible, the Christ, you know, Christian values, that has been in remission for 40 to 50 years. It is no longer like that. Today, if you were to say at work or school or on social media, well, I believe the target is wrong, 
you will most certainly receive feedback that says, what, are you some kind of Christian fundamentalist? You know, why do you have to be so intolerant of what other people want to do? But really, you have a right to express your thoughts and feelings about that issue, just as other people do. Just do it in a loving, non-judgmental way. And Target has the right in our society today to govern their restrooms and changing rooms as they choose. And you have the right to stop shopping there if you so choose. Where all this will lead us, I don't know. Because the line of, of morality keeps just getting pushed back of what's right and what's wrong and who gets to decide. I mean, what about middle school and high school boys who say, well, you know, sometimes I kind of identify as a girl, so I'd like to use the girls' restroom and, and the girls' locker room for PE. And then what if a 50-year-old teacher, male, says, you know, I feel the same way. I think I should do that. Who's to say that's wrong? You know, who's the self-appointed moral police who is so intolerant that they will not allow those boys and men to exercise the free expression of their beliefs and preferences? I'll be surprised if that doesn't come up to be an issue in the coming century. So it, it's a crazy world we live in. But Jesus, he gives three important biblical principles in Matthew chapter 7. Judge in the same manner that you want to, others to judge you. Second, realize that we do judge others a lot more harshly than we do ourselves. And third, judge only after taking the plank out of your own eye. You know, back in the 1960s, there were some popular words and phrases that have since gone out of circulation. But for instance, sock it to me. You might remember that. Uh, groovy, far out, right on. There was one, I think, got its start on a television show called Rowan and Martin's Laughing. It was, here comes the judge. Watch out now, because here comes the judge. Well, then over the past couple of decades, we've become familiar with this idea of a judge. There was Judge Judy, and then there was Judge Wapner, who Rain Man had to see, or he went crazy. Uh, a newer one, Judge Joe Brown. And of course, on a more serious note, the judges that sit on our nation's Supreme Court. But you know, one of these days, all people, including you, will pass from this life to the next. And at that time, according to the scriptures, you will stand before God in final judgment. That's the real judgment. That's when judgment really happens. And the basis of his judgment on you will not be, well, did you try your best? You know, did you try to live a good life? Did your number of good deeds outnumber your, your number of bad deeds? You know, how devout a religious person were you? That, those are not going to be the issues. The question is going to be, did you entrust your eternal soul into the hands of my son, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross as your only hope to forgive all your wrongdoings in life and to secure you a ticket into heaven in the next life? Let me say that again. Immediately following your death and mine, we will stand in final judgment before God. And the basis of his judgment will be, did you trust my son, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross as your only hope for getting into heaven? So judging others is a real, is a real issue. And we all face it probably more times than we think every day. But the ultimate judgment is the one that we really need to be ready for. So I want to remind you of that today. But Stan, we'll have our closing prayer. Lord, we thank you for this, this special day that's been set aside to honor our mothers and grandmothers and other, you know, that have played such a, a huge role in our lives. And Lord, for those who have their mothers with them here today, I pray that just gratitude would fill their hearts and they would honor their mother. For those who had a, have or have had a difficult relationship with their mother, we pray, God, that you would give them the strength to do what, you know, what they can to, to try to make that better. Lord, for those of us who've lost moms or grandmothers recently, we pray for your comfort. Lord, today we thank you for the words that Jesus spoke on that hillside 2,000 years ago. They just resonate today just as clearly in the case that he, of the matter today was don't judge. Don't judge. Don't condemn. 
Don't write people off. Don't assume you know all the facts. Just give people the benefit of the doubt as often as possible. Show love and compassion. And yet, you know, follow my guidelines in the Bible. God, we know it's a tough, we know it's a tough uh, road to walk sometimes. But I pray, God, that all of us here mostly would be prepared for that final, the real judgment. When we stand before you as sinners, people who have done a lot of wrong things, a lot of regrets, a lot of things we shouldn't have done, and we just throw ourselves on the mercy of your heavenly court through what Jesus did for us on the cross. God, we thank you that we can face life and death with confidence because of not what we do or don't do, but what he did for us. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We would be nowhere without what you did for us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.